have an unidentified flying object. I'm Jack Osborne, and you're listening. This is Hudson Hammond, and you're listening to... I'm Richard C. Hoagland, and you're listening to... I'm Art Bell, and you're listening to Dr. J Radio Live. We have an unidentified flying object. Now, let's go ahead and bring on our all-star guest. He was the publisher of UFO Magazine. You guys hear him Monday nights on Future Theater. He's an amazing host, but I think he's an even better guest because he is so full of information. As a matter of fact, I I don't think I'd be doing this I, if it wasn't for the information I received from this person. I'm going to tell you a little story before I, I introduce this person. If you guys have already not picked up on this, about ah, 10, 12 years ago, I was watching History Channel, and I knew a lot. I've been paying attention to this for three decades. And I knew a lot about UFOs and crash and retrievals. And so I wanted to subscribe, re- renew my subscription to UFO Magazine. Well, lo and behold, when I called, the actual publisher answers. And I said, I did not know about this crash. This blows me away. And he goes, oh, there's so much more. And he went on to tell me a few more. I was just blown away. I'm like, okay, instead of one year, let's just subscribe for three years. And and essentially, if it wasn't for the information, I probably would not be as well-versed as I am today. And I have to owe all that to Mr. Bill Burns. Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, Dr. J. Oh, it's always a pleasure to have you on. It's always a pleasure to speak to you. And if you heard my little story, it really was you. If you remember, I it was a long time ago. You probably don't remember. I uh, don't. That's yeah, true. it was late at night. You know, because I remember I who would who would answer the phone. I you know it was an eight hundred number. I believe that I called and you know you I asked you if you were in California at the time. You were on the East Coast and uh, you were telling me about all these other crash and retrievals, and I was like blown away. And I'd been subscribing to your magazine since then. I think 97, I think, was the first subscription I received. It was right around the Mars, uh, or the Face on Mars was one of the first issues. Right, I remember that issue. Yeah, and then, of course, the other one, which has to do with today's topic, was the one that had on the cover, The Day After Roswell. Remember that? That That was the red cover. In fact, I actually have that poster hanging up in my office. That, it was a, such a fantastic, I really wish you that magazine, if everybody out there listening can do whatever they can and bring that back to life. I mean, there are so many people, I'm sure now they would actually jump in and buy it. And I got to say, Bill has been on Discovery or History Channel several times. I've seen you, you hosted UFO Hunters, I believe, for what, two seasons? You were three on, seasons. Three seasons. You were on several of those specials, those one-off specials that they had. Uh, what are they called? Uh, UFO, uh, files? Uh, UFO Files ever since 2004, and then Ancient Aliens for the first four years. And now I'm on the Discovery Channel. See, exactly. And it just goes to show how much you they use you as an expert because you're so well-versed. Well, I know we could talk about so many different things about UFOs, but the reason I decided to bring you on today is two of my absolute favorite topics. For those of people who have been listening to the show for a long time know, I love alien abduction. Why? Because we're going to get answers from the be- people that actually have to do with the deal with the beings themselves. I mean, how else are we going to find that out? We're not going to get it from government officials. The other major thing I love is crash and retrievals. And Bill can tell you a lot about that. And we're going to talk about a very specific case. And that happens to be what we just talked about the day after Roswell, Philip Corso. Now, let's go back in time, Bill. Tell me when you first met Phil and how you actually got started on deciding to him telling the story and you guys putting it out there. Well, first of all, our first connection with Philip Corso had absolutely nothing to do with UFOs. Philip Corso uh, was testifying before his history goes back well, well, well before, at least with us, uh, with a motion picture company that licensed his uh, life story rights goes back well before anything having to do with UFOs. In fact, when we first met Colonel Corso, UFOs, the whole UFO story was not even on the table. It was um, something we didn't even know about. The whole point of our <clears throat> connection with Philip Corso 
had to do with POWs and uh, troops missing in action. He was testifying before, a, he was then a representative, Robert Dornan from Orange County, California. He was testifying before Dornan's subcommittee on POW MIAs. That's what Corso was doing. And he was testifying, and he came to our attention via two people. And then I'll tell you how I got involved. The two people were Neil Livingston, who was an intelligence expert who wrote the book Inside the PLO. And the other person was Chip Beck. Chip Beck was a United States Naval commander. Uh, he was a frogman during the Vietnam War, then an Navy SEAL. And he was... Uh, employed by the United States Department of Defense and he was investigating also POWs that were lost and MIAs from the Vietnam War. That was his area of investigation when we met him. And he was also part of the whole um, Dornan uh, research into POWs and this was from actually from the Vietnam War. Corso's job at, uh, during the Korean War, this was the Korean War, Corso's job was he was uh, an intelligence officer for um, the, um, the general staff, Douglas MacArthur. I think he was a captain at that point and, or a major. And, and he was an intelligence officer. And he was working on establishing targets. Remember, MacArthur wanted to bomb on the uh, north of uh, the parallel that divided North Korea and South Korea. And the Chinese army had troop divisions, nor I think it was the 38th parallel, north of the 38th parallel. And the, what the plan was, at least MacArthur's plan was, to use nuclear weapons, to drop five nuclear weapons on the Chinese troop emplacements north of the 38th parallel and it was Corso who was on the who was one of the planners coming up with the targets for those nuclear weapons so this is a very very um, important mission that Corso had after MacArthur was fired by President Harry Truman Corso then um, obviously was still working for the army he was still an intelligence officer and in 1953, he was brought to the White House to be on the, uh, an advisor, a military advisor to President Eisenhower. He was a military liaison to the National Security Staff. He was never on the National Security Council. He was on the National Security Staff, and that was his job um, on the National Security Staff. But he negotiated... He was part of the negotiating team. It wasn't a single-handed negotiation. He was on the team negotiating the exchange of prisoners of war after the Korean armistice or during the Korean armistice negotiations. And that exchange of prisoners was called Little Switch, Big Switch. And during those negotiations for the exchange, Corso uh, reported to Eisenhower that there were American POWs that were being held back by the Chinese and the Soviets. They would never be returned. And Corso's reasoning for that was that, look, we could keep on fighting the war over these POWs, but they are never coming home. These POWs are going to China they're going to be in North Korea or they're going to wind up in Soviet Union gulags. And the reason they would never come home, and this is very important because this actually helps define American history right through the Vietnam War. Corso said that the Soviets were using the identities of the American POWs as Corso called them playbacks. They were taking those identities and they were putting those identities on, they were inhabiting those identities with KGB 
spies, spies, espionage agents, agents provocateurs. They were deep conditioned through um, chemical conditioning, through hypnotic conditioning. They were conditioned to inhabit these identities, but below their level of consciousness, they had certain jobs to do blowing up railroad crossings, blowing up power plants, basically sabotage upon instructions from the Soviet Union. Now, what's so fascinating about this is that this is what defined Joseph McCarthy's um, entry into the whole communist conspiracy in the early 1950s. This was the reason for it. But there was another fascinating thing about this as well, that the CIA knew that there were Americans being held back. In fact, one of the stories Corso told about this was that one of the things that the Soviets did in the early part of the Korean War, our fighter jets were no match for the MiGs. The MiGs could fly higher, faster, and were more maneuverable than the fighter jets we were flying. Only until we introduced the F-86 Sabre jet were we on a par with the Soviets. And then what we introduced were radar-directed guns. And that, that tipped the balance in our favor uh, in the air war over Korea. Well, the Soviets did not know the technology behind our radar-directed guns. And so they would order a pilot to be shot down. The pilot would be shot down. They would be, um, he would be transported to a Soviet interrogation center. But the Soviet interrogation centers weren't prisons. They were um, camouflaged as American hospitals. So these pilots would be drugged. And when they came to... They would be told, oh, well, the United States won the war. You're in a United States hospital, but we need you to recover your memories. You were traumatized. You have amnesia. So we're going to ask you questions that will trigger your memories. And that's exactly how the Soviets were able to trick our American pilots, were able to interrogate our American pilots into giving up the secrets of the radar-directed guns on the F-86 Sabre jets. And for anybody who remembers there was a motion picture all the way back, I want to say, in the late 1960s, early 1970s with, Jim, with James Garner and, and uh, Eva Marie Saint called 36 Hours. That motion picture, which was ostensibly about the invasion of Normandy, took that story of what American pilots went through in the Soviet interrogation camps and translated that from the Korean War into World War II. The other thing that Corso mentioned about how the CIA came to know this is that the CIA had to be able to figure out who were spies and who were not spies. Well, especially since they were the ones, the, the spy agency, and they always had double agents everywhere, right? That's right. That's the thing. So how do you do that? How do you break through that conditioning? Well, the CIA didn't want to do this in the United States because they would have had to probably report to the um, congressional oversight committees. So what they did was they contracted with psychiatrists and neuropsychologists in Canada to do experiments on human beings applying uh, all kinds of chemical tests and electrodes implanted into the cerebral cortex to unconsciously uh, to involuntarily elicit memories. And one of those psychiatrists that was working for the CIA in Canada was a, name, was a man called Wilder Penfield. And folks who read the books I'm Okay, You're Okay, and the book The Games People Play, and the, of course another song, The Games People Play, those song, uh, uh, that song and those books these were books about what became known as um, uh, a trans um, a transactional psychology, finding your child, finding your parent, finding yourself. That came out of the uh, CIA-sponsored research in Canada. Another person hired by the CIA was a very famous psychiatrist who worked at Harvard 
called Donald Hebbs. And Donald Hebbs coined the phrase, neurons that fire together, wire together. And he developed the whole theory of neural networks, of neural pathways and neural networks, hierarchical neural networks. And that became the basis for modern digital computing. So these experiments, the other experiments were being done at Harvard in the 1950s to test resiliency. And this one professor at Harvard by the name of Harry Murray was doing resiliency testing and one of his young students, a 17-year-old at-risk kid, a genius, went to Harvard very early at 17, was a young man by the name of Ted Kaczynski. And he became, as partly as a result of those experiments, he became the Unabomber. So this is ah, a very famous story. That I didn't so, know. That's yeah, I know. A few and of course, did. everybody knows that he was a genius, a math genius. I, wasn't he at MIT or Berkeley? A he professor? was at Berkeley. Yeah, he was a professor of math at Berkeley, and uh, he uh, and and he only was discovered as the Unabomber after he wrote this manifesto that his brother and his mother recognized. He was living in a little wooden shack in Montana, building his own bombs, putting them in his bicycle, riding him to the post office. Nobody even knew what he, who he was or where he was. He eluded the FBI for 13 years. And, and let me actually jump in and say that's exactly how what the terrorists or what we labeled as terrorists, uh, if they were really operating that way, in the Middle East to do. They don't use current technology. They don't send emails, hey, let's go bomb this. No, they do exactly what Ted Kaczynski did. They would, you know, use hand-to-hand talk, you know, speak like riding on a bicycle and passing, uh, you know, speaking to someone versus calling someone just, just to stay off the radar. And I think that's... Well, that's a- how we identified Osama bin Laden, where he was, because one of the couriers that was doing, actually used a cell phone we were able to pinpoint that cell phone location, follow that particular signal, and that's how we found out that Osama bin Laden was in Abbottabad. Exactly, because he violated Osama's... He violated the code, exactly. In fact, that was the same way we, that was the same way we, uh, the the DEA and the CIA identified the whereabouts of the big drug dealer, Pablo Escobar. Um, He, his son, what they used when they used cell phones, they would use cell phones called burners. They used them once, they throw them away. And since Escobar's cartel owned the cell phone company in Colombia, he was able to get all the cell phones he wanted. Well, this one son did not throw away the cell phone, and that's how they were able to pinpoint the lo- Escobar's location. So that was, that was um, how they uncovered Escobar and eventually killed him. Well, let me so, actually, go ahead. Finish this. Go I was going to say we actually have a caller, uh, area code four one five. Uh, welcome to the show. What's your name? Third phase of the moon. Oh no, area four one five. Is that what you are? Third phase. Yeah, my name is Wade. Oh, Wade, Wade. Do you have a question for Bill? Well, yeah. Well, well my question is: it, it just seems about these orbs, and I took a, a selfie, and I got this or on the side of my head on the photo, I didn't put it there and it has demonic alien looking structure in the face and everything. Everybody keeps telling me I'm being watched by something. How is that possible to get into my phone? I didn't take the picture, put, the, put that or in my picture. How is that possible? Because um, your cell phone is always, unless you take the battery or the SIM card out of your phone, it's always on whether your phone is powered off, it doesn't matter. That SIM card in your phone is transmitting a signal. That signal is going to, that signal contains uh, the PIN, the personal identification number for that particular phone. It is always transmitting that signal. So if you log on to AP News or you log on somewhere, it knows your location. But it's a two-way device. In other words, you're sending a signal up to a satellite and that satellite is um, downloading it to whatever relay station um, you're, that you're trying to connect to, but it's also downloading a signal to your phone. So 
In reality, as long as you carry a cell phone around with you, whether it's on or whether it's off, your location okay. is identifiable at all times, and your phone but, is wide open. But how is it possible to get a, a like an image in that orb, and I didn't put it there? That's that's what I'm got. I went to my pastor. I talked to my family, and everybody keeps telling me something's following you, bro. And before they this, are. in Every October, yeah. Let me tell you what happened. This is very. Um, you're, you're like my hero, Bill. I'm, this is so freaky for me right now. I took two pictures in October and a 35 second video here in San Francisco Ocean Beach. Soon after that, in January, I took that selfie picture, and that's when that appeared on the side of my head. And so you I'm, said I'm, there's I'm faces like, in there or something because I've actually seen. No, it it, it there is a face. There's two eyes. There. There's huh? big eyes. There's a nose and there's a mouth, and it, it, it's it's very orb? clear. It's, yes. Well, we'd love to have to see that. Do you mind? Yeah, uh, I want to send it to you. Yeah. Send, I'll I'll send, send, it it into doc, send it into Dr. J so we can see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just send, go on to Dr. J Radio Live or even use Dr. J Radio Live at Gmail and send it there or via the contact on, right. page. Okay. Uh, Dr. J Radio Live? Yeah. Either uh, go okay. to the .com and use the contact page or at Gmail. That's the same name for every account. Everybody who's listening, you want to use Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Flickr, Tumblr, Skype. That's the only name anybody needs okay. to remember. But we'd love I mean, to see I mean, that. Trying to, I, would, I would love to send to you guys. Your, your, your yeah, program is it, amazing. I'll absolutely get it to Bill, and we'd love, we'd love to Since get this, this out there. To me, this has happened to me. I've noticed a lot of things here by the airport in San Francisco, a lot of forests, a lot of things that are staying in the sky. And I, I have lots of pictures of them, but the 35-second the video, I need to have it critiqued and blown up really, really clear, but it's something that was really, really odd, and everybody's yeah, telling send, me. Yeah, send, it, send, it, in. send it in. Send it in. We'll, gotcha. we'll take a look at it. Yes. Thank you so much. You guys much have a great me. evening. Yes. Thank you Thank so you. much for the information, and um, see you guys soon. Yeah, yeah, get that to us, and we'll get it analyzed. Anyway, Bill, didn't mean to interrupt that. Just no, that's okay. So, are good. Go on. Okay, so, so, so Ted Kaczynski was not identified as the Unabomber until he wrote this big manifesto. And his mother and his, his brother recognized the writing and said it was him. And, he, and that manifesto was published. Well, here's how pathogenic, um, here's how psychopathogens are transmitted. So that particular manifesto was read by uh, another psychopath over in Norway by the name of Anders Brevik. Anders Brevik wrote his manifesto plagiarizing Ted Kaczynski's manifesto. And Anders Brevik was the Norwegian guy who, who, who set bombs off in, uh, in Oslo and then murdered all these teenagers at the island of Utoya because he claimed that Norway was being infiltrated by non-Aryan people. He was a racist. And that was a big mass murder about uh, 10 or so years ago. Then Anders Brevik wrote this manifesto, and that manifesto was read by none other than Adam Lanza in Newtown, Connecticut, who used that manifesto as his rationale for all the shootings at Sandy Hook Elementary School. Copycatting Adam Lanza was this person, Ivan Lopez, at Fort Hood, who referenced Adam Lanza when he did the mass shooting at Fort Hood. So this is a story that goes all the way, all the way, all the way back to the late night to, to the early 1950s in what the Soviet Union did to condition American pilots in Korea. And this is the story that Corso told to the Robert Dornan committee. And he was asked by Dornan, did Eisenhower know that the Soviets were keeping back our POWs? And Corso said yes, and Eisenhower wrote an intelligence finding. He signed an intelligence finding acknowledging this. Well, everybody said about Corso, look, the guy is a nut. He belongs to the Shikassini Knights of Malta, this kind of right-wing, crazy right-wing group. He, he's a madman. He's, he's self-aggrandizing. The person who was also testifying with Corso was this guy Golanowski. Golanowski claimed to be a descendant of Tsar Nicholas. I mean, it was, well... 
during the committee hearings, everybody went looking for the Eisenhower intelligence finding. The problem was they couldn't locate it. They went to the National Archives, and finally they had the bright idea to go to the Eisenhower Library. And at the Eisenhower Library, they discovered Eisenhower's own intelligence finding, and on it, in Eisenhower's handwriting, he wrote, pass to Corso. And suddenly, in, in that summer, I believe it was 1995, in that summer, Corso became the poster boy for about American military intelligence, and he was on, uh, he was on Time magazine and Newsweek, and he came to our attention at that point. And this motion picture company in Los Angeles, I was working for them. I was not writing with Corso. I was working for them. I was editing a book for them that I was then going to sell as a New York literary agent. I was going to sell it about POW MIAs. And Corso was going to be our consultant for the POW MIA story. Again, nothing to do with UFOs. And so we had this big meeting with Phil Corso where we were talking about his experiences in Korea, POWs, MIAs. And the two people working with us on that book were Jim Sanders, whose story will be on Art Bell next week, Jim Sanders, and Chip Beck, the CIA station chief, the youngest CIA station chief in history um, in Angola. Well, at this meeting, Corso starts talking about his history in the military. And one of the stories he told us was that he was at Fort Riley. Now, again, there's no corroborate. We know that he was at Fort Riley. I mean, that's what we know because we saw his military records. And we know that he worked in Army R&D. We know that he was ahead of the in charge of the foreign technology desk at Army R&D. And we know that he eventually became the deputy director under Lieutenant General Arthur Trudeau at Army R&D. And Corso told us some wild stories about what he did when he was working in Eisenhower's White House as a military liaison for the National Security uh, staff, about um, which turned out to be true. He told this story about how Arthur Trudeau had been the head of United States military intelligence, Army G2, when he was a two-star general. He was a major general, and he was the head of Army intelligence. And he discovered that the um, Stasi, the, um, the, the United States at the end of World War II, absorbed into um, its own intelligence, and then after the National Security Act into uh, the CIA, the Galen spy ring, the, uh, the Galen German spy ring. Well, that spy ring had been penetrated by the East German spy organization called the Stasi. It was the Stasi that trained Che Guevara. They were very close to the Cubans. And so they had penetrated uh, that spy ring. And army intelligence had discovered that the CIA's own Eastern European spy ring had been penetrated. So what uh, Trudeau did was he went to Eisenhower and blew the whistle on the CIA. Well, the CIA was so furious that they wanted Trudeau thrown out of the army. They uh, mandatory retirement, throw him out of the army. And a number of high-ranking military officers and junior officers, and Corso was among them working at the White House, went to Senator Strom Thurmond on the Armed Services Committee and said, look what they're doing to this world, to this Korean War hero, Arthur Trudeau. He's a Korean War hero, an Army engineer. He was a general. He was a, he was a general in the Korean War. Look what they're doing to him. They are cashiering this general. And... Strom Thurmond said to Eisenhower, you know what? If you throw this man, Trudeau, out of the army, we will not approve any new members of the Army General's Corps. No new generals if you punish Trudeau. 
In fact, what we want is for you to reward Trudeau. And so Eisenhower acquiesced to Strom Thurmond, and Corso said he was partly responsible for this. Eisenhower acquiesced and rewarded Trudeau with his third star, but then posted Trudeau not to some high, very important position in the army. He sent him to this backwater, this jerkwater whistle stop, this little whistle stop command called Army R&D. And it was at Army R&D in 1956 that Arthur Trudeau discovered Project Horizon, an army plan to put a fortified military base on the moon. Oh, and quick. Uh, before we go much further, Johnny wanted to ask you something about East Germans. Go, go ahead, Johnny. I wanted to know, uh, was you aware that the East Germans, obviously in the Russian days when it was the Cold War, were, were keeping jars, and inside the jars were scents of every person that they'd sort of arrested. So if they arrested you, they took your scent and then put it in a jar and kept it, just like today's fingerprints. Well, yeah, there was a lot of that stuff going on. I mean, uh, remember that, the, that one of the reasons that um, they were interested in all this sensory information was that the olfactory sense, the olfactory scent mechanism is so powerful that it, I mean, and this goes back to primeval human beings and a life on planet Earth. That's why dogs sniff. It is so important that it connects directly into certain memory areas of the brain. So, and, and, and you and see this today. And too. And right, as exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and this is, how, this is how human beings were able to communicate um, through, through the, uh, um, on an olfactory way, even before language. You could, smell, uh, you could smell sexually. You could smell hostility. And, in fact, dogs still do that. I mean, well, still do that. They've always done that. They can smell fear. That's where you get this whole thing. Oh, I smelled his fear. Exactly. Sure. Yeah, it is true. Release, release. And so that's why they were doing that. The From Soviets were experimenting on every single sensory input as they tried to figure out ways to transmit information and affect areas of the brain. That was partly what was going on. And the other aspect, too, was that the Soviets and the Americans, both sides at the end of World War II, were using medical information that was um, developed by Josef Mengele at Auschwitz and uh, German doctors. So this was, they were using this terrible stuff, but these were part of the experiments going on at Auschwitz on human beings. We actually have a, a caller, and I recognize this I caller, area code 951. It's uh, Dan, who has one of the coolest people who tweets and is a, a listener, dedicated listener to Dark Matter Digital Network. Dan, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Dr. J. Hey, uh, don't, don't bother going into the government, because I, I, I tell you, man, once I, once I give Bill Burns my theory of everything, it, your job will be gone. <laughs> hey, okay, hey, okay. Uh, I just want to know how to get a hold of you, Bill. Just uh, uh, it, it, you're one of my heroes, to, by the way. Yeah, yeah you've been mine. Uh, 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 just write to Future Theater, and you can get a hold of me. Okay, yeah, I, FutureTheater dot com. I'm. I'm uh, I, <laughs> I tell you right now, I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm working on. I'm working on this thing that's just driving me crazy. That's why I haven't been really uh, uh, twi twittering and this and that. But uh, uh, you know, it. Uh, I can explain the Nazca lines now. Oh, and one thanks, night, what uh, we'll do is we'll set up an open lines and I'll invite everybody who's got cool stories to call in and, and share everything they got. Oh, great, man. But uh, I'm just about ready to put out these, these uh, uh, next couple of videos that uh, I, I swear it's, uh, it's, it's going to blow you away. Okay, well, we're looking uh, forward to seeing them. Yeah, All absolutely. Right. Remember, go to futuretheater.com. Absolutely. You know my site. Uh, and like I said, Bill is my hero. Actually, Bill, I just got another message here today. I, we, were, we were talking about you were on History Channel today, as a matter of fact. As what okay. I've been, just so That's you know. Nice. Okay. Uh, let's go back to, of course, how the story going with Trudeau and, of course, these medical experiments, which ultimately led to Trudeau giving... Philip Corso, that, that three-drawered cabinet in the right. Pentagon. 
Exactly. What what, uh, what happened was Corso, um, after he left his command, uh, he was rotated out of his command in southern Germany, where he was a field artillery officer. Um, he had nuclear weapons. Um, he was one of the few officers authorized to use tactical nuclear weapons at uh, the Army missile testing range at Red Canyon. Corso had trained a battalion to use nuclear-tipped anti-aircraft missiles. Well, in Germany, one of the things Corso had done, Corso's job was he was a, a forward base, and their job was um, to fire all their missiles out at Soviet bombers coming over, fire all their missiles out, and then get the hell out of there. You know, you just fire your missiles and get out. Well, here's something that Corso did. He was able to figure out a way to get his anti-aircraft missiles, turn them into ballistic missiles, and explode them a mile or a half mile off the surface. And these were nuclear weapons. And so Corso's plan was not just to take down the squadrons of Soviet or East German bombers, but the plan was to use the missiles as, as tactical ballistic missiles to take out the Soviet tanks, because one of our fears in NATO was that the Soviets would send massive amounts of tanks through the southern flank and simply outflank us. And Corso's job was to fire those missiles, torch them off, take out as many tanks as he could, and get out of there. Well, when Corso finished that command, when he was finally um, he was retiring, and Corso was a reserve officer, not an active officer. He was activated for World War II, but he was in the Army Reserve. So Corso had to spend one more year in the reserve before he was allowed to retire. And that year was spent as the um, investigating general in the Maryland National Guard, which, is, which was his final year in the Army. Well, Trudeau, knowing what Corso did in, when he was at the White House, specifically when he took over the command of Army R&D, he, he found, that's when he realized that Army R&D had a, a cache of material that was sent to them um, after the crash at Roswell. And, of course, from other, I would assume, other crash and retrievals, right? But obviously well, the, well, he was the, well, the big thing was, Roswell. Well, the big thing was the Roswell file. Yeah. And so that's what he had at the Pentagon. And well, he I, was... When I first read the book, right, it, it just it blew my mind away. And, of course, and the reason I knew of the book was, thankfully, to your magazine and it being on the cover, I literally went out and bought it the next day, and I was just blown away. And I remember, and I know you could expand on this, some of the stuff that he r pulled out and read. For instance, he read the autopsy report, and there happened to be a lens. Then there also happened to be a laser, but when he would leave a a line on the wall, or it would leave a hole in the wall rather than just a, like a laser pointer. Uh, then there was, of course, what uh, there was so much more. Real quick, let me let's go ahead and take this other caller, and I know this one as well. He's actually got some amazing videos, which everybody will see soon. Uh, a contactee, and much, much more than that. Area code two two three nine, and it's Ward. Ward, welcome to the show. You got any questions? Hey, for Bill? how you doing, Doctor J and Bill? How you doing? We're doing uh, great. We're fine. Yep. Yeah. Got anything uh, for yeah, hey, Bill? Bill, yeah. Um, I was wondering what happened uh, to those guys that used to work with on uh, UFO hunters. Are they still involved in uh, UFOs or? Well, Pat. Uh, let's see. There were uh, there were three other guys, and then there was Garth Baldwin. Let's do Garth Baldwin first because he was our um, archaeological landscape guy, uh, our historian. Garth Baldwin is now working on, I think, a series that History Channel is trying to, to pull together on, um, it's not Men in Black, but it's America's Secrets. It's like secret stuff the government tries to um, right, keep right, from yeah, American I've seen that, yeah. That's what he, yeah, That's what he's doing. And then Ted Ackworth um, uh, worked for NASA. He was at MIT. He went to Sloan Business School at MIT, and he started his own company called Arteic up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and that's where he is, and they've had a second child, and that's wonderful for Ted. I, I spoke to him a while back. Pat Uskert 
uh, went back to uh, the Czech Republic, and he is now working on a documentary movie about his travels through Eastern Europe. And Pat and I were tr- we were involved in setting up a show ostensibly for history on Men in Black. It's not a show they picked up. They were they were fielding um, uh, uh, sizzle reels, and ours was not one of the ones they picked up. But Pat and I were working on that. And then there's uh, Jeff Tomlinson, and Jeff is married now. I think he's a father. I think he's a parent, and um, he. I think he he finished graduate school. And then there was Kevin Cook, and Kevin had a brief job on another show. Uh, but now he is a product engineer, and I don't know who he's working for. So, yeah, they all went on their separate okay. ways. All right. Thanks a lot, Bill. Thank you. You're welcome. Wade. And, of course, everybody out there listening soon, you'll see on the YouTube's channel some really amazing video. Wade will talk tomorrow about that more. Uh, we've been in communication. Uh, I don't want to give too right. much until everybody hears from Ward, uh, but you will right. get all this information. Ward, thanks again for calling in. And of okay, course, you guys uh, have a good night. We will. You know, Thank Bill, you. All right. so now, when I was explaining some of the materials, there was the laser, there was the lens, uh, there was what seemed to be what like a, a glass filament with filaments sticking out, and then right, that became fiber optic. Yeah, that became fiber optic cable. Right, and then the what seemed to be like a wafer with microchips, I believe. Which, right, it, it was basically an, an integrated circuit. The, yes. the, the thing, uh, uh, the point that we tried to make in the book was this, and this really became misinterpreted by a lot of people. These were not things that created the inventions later on. The American industry, first of all, Arthur Trudeau in his memoirs confirmed a lot of this stuff except for their real origin. Arthur Trudeau, in his memoirs, writes that he went to Strom Thurmond and said that he needed a budget to develop technology that was not invented in this country. We didn't invent this stuff. And he said this was great technology there's the stuff that American industry was working on but hadn't perfected. And if they could see this technology, it would give them a jump ahead to see a finished product. And Strom Thurmond said to Arthur Trudeau, we will only give you this budget that you want if and only if this material is invented in the United States. So... Imagine the challenge. You have to take advanced technologies, wherever they're from, advanced technologies, and you have to bring them to American industry to reverse engineer, then get the patents so American industries own them, and for that, they would get funded to develop. So this had already happened in 1947 after the crash at Roswell. One of the stories that was floating around that Corso actually heard was that after the crash at Roswell, and remember, everybody should remember this, whenever somebody screams, oh, we've never had disclosure, we need disclosure, Harry Truman in 1950 disclosed the existence of UFOs. He said, these things are flying saucers and we know what they are. And he did this in public in front of the news media. So Harry Truman was well aware, he was the president in 1947, he was well aware of the existence of flying saucers, and he was well aware that we knew what they were. So Harry Truman's order to the military in 1947 was, find the lowest common denominator of technology, and take that to that portion of American industry that was working on that technology, give it to them so they could see a finished product and they could engineer it and get a patent. That piece of technology was essentially a silicon chip. And let me say one thing that I really, really, truly loved about this. 
he was in the research and division foreign technology department. So when he would go to these companies and they would say, where did this come from? Uh, he would say it would be foreign technology. They would assume Soviet technology or Nazi technology, but no one really uh, you know, asked the question it, where it really came from. And I just thought that was a really fascinating part of what Corso went through. Right, because one of the things that Corso had stressed was that the Army had its technology, the Navy had its technology, and the CIA wanted that technology. So there was a war going on inside the Beltway among the various intelligence services. So ONI wanted one thing, Army Intelligence wanted something else, and Army R&D was sitting with its own cache of materials. And remember, in, 19, in August 1947, the military services split. So material that went to Wright Field in 1947 wound up as the property of the Air Force, the, uh, the newly formed United States Air Force. So there was this scramble for technology going on among uh, the different military, uh, the branches of the military. So part of the job of Army R&D was to keep its own technology to itself and keep the CIA from getting it, but at the same time, getting a budget that they could then give to defense contractors to develop this technology into something. And so uh, in 1947-48, this circuitry went to Bell Labs, where Bretain and Shockley had been working on a, um, an integ um, a circuit, a switch, basically a switch, that would replace the Edison tube. The Edison tube is basically the incandescent light bulb, the DeForest tube. It's what was in the old television sets in the 1950s. I remember in the back of the, you opened up a television set or you opened up the back of a radio and what you would see would be all these lit tubes and there'd be a filament between the tubes and they would be passing current from pole to pole. The problem was these tubes blew out and so I remember very well that um, if you could fix your own television set, if you could go in the back of that set and you turned it on, you would see which tube wasn't lit. So you'd pull the tube out, you'd take it to a lot of the drug stores, the pharmacies in the 1950s had things called tube testers. And you'd put the tube in the socket in the tube tester, and if the tube was burnt out, you would it would show the tube wasn't passing any current and you'd buy a new tube from a television store match it with the tube you took out put it back in your set you could repair your own television set that was back in the uh, this was this was way before tv tv monitors you can imagine so that was the technology in the um 90 in in the early 1950s i remember in 1949 one of the things that pertain when Bretain and Shockley saw this um, piece of technology that they were given by the army, they'd been working since the 1930s on a way to replace the Edison tube as um, a circuit switch. Well, they then reverse engineered this. They figured out what the chemical composition should be of the base of this. And suddenly, after all their failed experiments, they were able to create this device called a transistor. It was a resistor, but a transmitter at the same time. They called it the transistor. This was patented in 1948 and 1949, had a commercial patent, and by the time the 1950s rolled around, everybody was walking around with these tiny little transistor radios. And that was one of the first pieces. But Bell Labs patented the transistor in its own name. They gave Bertain and Shockley the patents. Well, supposedly the army was infuriated that a device that came from a crashed flying saucer at Roswell wound up being patented by Bell Labs. Well, this sat there for 11 years. So finally, when Trudeau went to Strom Thurmond and, com and, and said, look at all this technology, I'm sure this is going to, we can develop this. And Strom Thurmond pointed to the fact that the army had been furious that Bell Labs patented the material. And Thurmond said, no, we will only give you this money if this is patented in the United States. And so what Trudeau needed 
was essentially a bag man, somebody to take this technology around to other companies. And that's what, did, what Corso ended up doing, being the, the guy? So, and so he pulled Corso, who was about to retire from the Army, yanked him into Army, Army R&D, and said, spend your next two years here. You be my bag man. You be in charge of the foreign technology desk. I can't do it myself personally. This is what Corso said. Corso said this. I can't do it myself personally. You do it. And Corso became basically a messenger. And that was his job in Army R&D, a messenger. Let me uh, let me throw this in because we're going to go to break in a couple minutes. Uh, some of the first of all, when Corso went around, he had an unlimited budget, right? Uh, that's what at least he he claimed in interviews. I remember there was an interview on the local here in Los Angeles KCOP that I videotaped back when this story broke when the poor guy was still alive. Uh, and and let me throw this out there too. I know he passed away six months later, but do you think it was the Russian flu, meaning? Uh, no, 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 no. Corso had uh, 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 the real story was this. Okay, you're going to go to break, so I'll start the story. You could pick it up after the break, and it, and and it it goes something like this. I've got to be the one to say this: that Corso was not this gentle old man. He really wasn't. Corso was. Uh, he'd been an. He he was a spy. He'd been an in army intelligence. He was a beltway military insider. He knew how to play the game of infighting inside the government. So that's first of all. So I want to dispel that myth that he was some gentle old man. He was not. The other thing was that Corso was, uh, he was an opportunist and he was always looking for the best deal. And in 1994, beginning of 1995, the best deal came from uh, this motion picture company that licensed, that optioned, optioned his life story rights for his role in the army. That was the deal. We are optioning your life story rights for your career in the army. It's very important. That was the contract. I remember I, that I, I didn't know, really. Right. Yeah, so I had that contract. Then, uh, ostensibly, this was to work on the POW MIA book that I was supposed to edit. That was my job, edit and sell this particular book. I was harmonizing two manuscripts, one from Jim Sanders, one from Chip Beck, into one book with Corso's participation. It was only after Corso dropped these two bombs, bomb one, he was the chief investigator for the Internal Government Security Committee, subcommittee for the United States Senate, in which capacity he investigated the Warren Commission. So that was A. B, he had worked in Army R&D his last two years in the military before he went to the Senate, where he had custody of this Roswell file cabinet. And suddenly, everybody moved from doing a, a book about MIA's POWs to doing a book about his experience with the Roswell technology. And it was then my job to sell that particular book. So they went back to Corso and wrote this con rewrote this option agreement which included either a motion picture or a book the book corso's personal memoir it's not a ufo book stressed again and again it was never intended to be a book about ufos it was corso's personal memoir his story if either one of those, we got a deal for either one of those, that would be the um, condition precedent to turn your, 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 you've graduated law school, so you know what a condition yes. precedent is. That's right. That would, that would turn the option into a purchase. And it was my job as a New York literary agent. And for you and Lou Sheehan, who's probably listening, right. notes that a New York literary agent is different 
as a matter of law from a Los Angeles, from a California talent agent. Uh, just very briefly, a California talent agent is an employment agent. And so if you're a writer and you want to sell your script to a motion picture company, you are then hired by the motion picture company as an employee and you convey your rights in and to the property you are writing to the motion picture company. You are now under the 1976 Copyright Act a work for hire. In new, and the agent who represents you is an employment agent who must be licensed and bonded in the state of California. And, but a New York literary agent is not representing you as an employee. The New York literary agent represents your own intellectual property, which you own in the state of New York, in Your the state IP. of New York, as a, exactly. as, and, yeah, yes, as a dramatic writer or as a literary writer, nonfiction or fiction. We'll that was that my job. Right when we come back, and we'll also talk about Corso's experience. Everybody stay tuned. We'll be right back. This is Travis Walton, and you're listening to Dr. J Radio Live. This is Foster Gamble, and you are listening to Dr. J Radio Live. Ah, nice, as you can hear, my friends. Uh, of course, Foster Gamble being one of the nicest, coolest people that I know. Uh, he could have gone with the billionaire agenda. Instead, he became a philanthropist and made the movie thrive, if you haven't seen it. Of course, you heard Travis Walton there. Uh, you've got all sorts of people that have been on the show. If you guys haven't heard their interviews or missed them when you were here, all you have to do is go to the YouTube channel. But you will hear more of that near the end of the show. Right now, I want to turn it back to Bill. First, let's, Bill, let's ask you where everyone can find you. I know we brought up futuretheater.com, but what else would you like to say for everybody? That's else? it. It's just, it's just future theater. I mean, you could go to the Simon & Schuster website. You'll see the books uh, that I've done for SNS. Um, I'm sure there's an author page somewhere else, but yeah, it's future theater, really. Uh, 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 that's where it is. And, of course, I want to say... Uh, Anybody who wants to call in this hour, by all means, you can. Uh, either 818-923-1713. Once again, 818-923-1713. Or Skype in via Dr. J Radio Live. You could also try Skydiving Lawyer, whichever of the two works easier for you. One or the other will get you through, or all three will get you through. You can also use Twitter. Just use hashtag DM Talk. I am definitely watching this Twitter feed, and I got some amazing comments and some cool ones. Actually, we do have a caller, and I'm going to introduce him in a second. But, Bill, we got a question from a caller who called in last hour. This is from Dan, and this is from the DarkMatterDigitalNetwork.com Twitter feed. Again, all you have to do is hashtag DM Talk, and I will see it, and we'll read your comment or question on air. Here's the question. Wasn't Corso the guy who briefed the president on UFOs? Corso said that, again, Corso said, I'm prefacing this because this is this was the what he told me. Corso said that he had told Eisenhower about what he saw at Fort Riley in 1947. I mean, that's literally... That was the extent of it. Um, by the time he was at Army R&D, it was 1961. It was right after the Kennedy inauguration in 1961. And, of course, Eisenhower was out of office. Um, Kennedy had his own long, his own interesting history with UFOs. But um, Corso only wound up doing a backdoor briefing to Kennedy on the CIA's activities in fronting for the Southeast Asian narco traffickers for drug lords in Southeast Asia. Um, they were um, laundering money through the CIA that was laundering money through Mexican banks. That's what Corso 
wound up. I think it, it was a backdoor briefing because he testified to that before the Senate Judiciary Committee in 19, I want to say 1960, it was right after he left the army. So it would have been in, in very early 63 or late 62. Um, he briefed the Senate. I have the the testimony here somewhere. He, uh, he, he briefed, um, that was his testimony. And that testimony was charged out by the Attorney General Robert Kennedy and it went to Jack Kennedy, and Jack Kennedy, um, after, uh, again, I st- I'm speculating, after he read that, he then uh, said he wanted to pull the CIA paramilitary out of Southeast Asia, and he created um, the Army Green Berets and the Navy SEALs, but he pulled the CIA out, and that's when he withdrew his support from the ZM regime, ZM was then the premier, the um, the leader of um, South Vietnam, and Kennedy wanted to withdraw the American advisors from South Vietnam, and that's a whole other story about what set into motion the wheels of the Kennedy assassination. But Corso never briefed Kennedy directly on UFOs. We have a caller who happens to be uh, my web guy. It does a fantastic job at drjradiolive.com. Uh, Tom, I know you got an amazing question for Bill. Go ahead, Tom. Hey, Bill. It's good to hear you, man. I got to see uh, they were ev- they were airing one of the episodes this morning, I think, on History Channel. And uh, oh. there was the one they were talking about uh, the UFOs over the north side of uh, Norton Air Force Base, I believe, or, or Edwards. I oh, think right, it was. right, right. Yeah. It was Edwards. Yeah, that was with yeah. Chuck Sorrell and... and um, uh, George Merritt, I think, was on that show. But yeah, that was cool. But you were talking earlier about vacuum tubes. What do you think is going to be the next thing that kind of uh, comes out? I saw today a little note about how they're getting closer to fusion. Uh, fusion reactors are becoming more of a possibility, a uh, scale down with uh, you know superconductors and that kind of thing. What do you think the next big thing is going to be if there's going to be another uh, kind of a, a reveal from some of this technology? I. I- I personally think that can uh, uh, that really the, uh, the next big thing is going to be the wireless transmission of electricity, which actually was developed by Nikola Tesla at the beginning of the 20th century. But but I think that's the thing that's uh, that's going to be perfected, um, <clears throat> lighting houses wirelessly, that you're not going to need these big power transmission lines. That there is going to be an array. The problem is. That in developing that technology, look at how vulnerable that technology would be to um, uh, an EMP. I mean, even now, if the Iranians and uh, and you look at this Iranian uh, nuclear deal, which you know, for my money, fails to control the obvious, which is if the Iranians can't develop a nuclear weapon in Iran then why won't they just buy one from the North Koreans? They have plenty of them over North Korea. They could develop all they want to in North Korea. And, and, and literally, it's, one, it's 24 hours away from Pyongyang to Tehran to get a nuclear weapon. I mean, yes, we could intercept the ship. Uh-huh. Yes, we can this. Yes, we can that. But the point is, um, and Iran is not going to bomb the United States with a nuclear weapon. What they're going to do is torch off a nuke. Same with the North Koreans. Imagine if the two of them did this. They torch off a nuke um, in, in low Earth orbit, which fries our entire satellite communication system, and we are blind. And folks who want to read about that as a possibility can download the book or buy the book Space Wars by Bill Scott, Mike Kamatos, and myself. It's a Tor Forge novel about what happens when a foreign power like the North Koreans set off a nuclear weapon in Earth orbit that fries our own communication system, our GPS, our surveillance system, and what we then do to avoid a nuclear war with China. But to get back to this, um, I think the next technology will be the wireless transmission of electricity and the storage of electrical energy, um, solar energy, yeah, in Tesla, and the Tesla batteries that are being developed by Elon Musk's company, um, well, don't I you think, think that is going to be? 
don't you think this whole thing, Musk is actually pushing the envelope with his own capital, which is great. He's actually forcing the question because uh, without him pushing, none of these power companies were going to let anybody just like he's got that battery thing you can hang on your wall. He's that's, got electric that's cars. The that's the technology. Yeah, he's that he's is, forcing that is it. The level of te- yeah, that's the level of technology. The level of technology is going to be each house – each dwelling right, we're removing is its the own grid. power generator. You're removing the grid, but leaving a grid in place so that the excess of power that you get from the sun um, or wind, that will almost go into a power bank, which is going to be a grid of input, not a grid of output. But don't you think that that's really kind of a survival thing on the on the behalf of the electric companies? You know, they see the people are going off grid. They see them building solar. They see them building their own off grid power systems, and they they're they're fighting for their own survival now. They're fighting for their own justification. Well, sure, but I mean, um, the the fact is, one of the things that these power companies can do is they can create. They can be the ones to distribute that technology and have a power bank. I mean, just imagine if um, uh, the power companies, instead of uh, running wires above ground that are going to blow down whenever a tree branch falls them, uh, falls on them, instead of burning coal, instead of burning natural gas, imagine if they were able to develop a very sophisticated grid of individual homes as their own power stations. And the overflow of that electricity, again, from wind, from from solar, that goes into a kind of a power bank. So the United States, and I'm thinking obviously um, American-centric, never runs out of power. As long as the sun is in the sky, as long as the wind blows, as long as water flows, we never run out of power. And if we're powering cars electrically and we're powering our homes and industry electrically, then we might reverse the um, carbon emissions that are basically destroying the planet. Johnny actually has a question for you. Go ahead, Johnny. So, um, I saw a documentary on batteries being charged wi- by Wi-Fi. Do you know anything about that? Sorry about the noise. That is one level of technology that we are seeing that there is wireless, that there's wireless charging of batteries, and I really think that is the next generation, maybe in the next decade, maybe in the next two decades, of how power will be transmitted. Nikola Tesla in the Colorado Springs experiment demonstrated that power, I mean, it was crude, but he demonstrated that power could be transmitted wirelessly. He was able to light a light bulb through the wireless transmission of power. We know that's nothing new, don't we? Because we've got, you know, Tesla doing that, you know, 100 years ago or whatever. That's right. That's right. But we never developed that technology because what happened was the power companies, the, um, uh, um, oil companies, they're the ones that were making money off this. Remember, when Tesla showed that experiment to, um, I want to say it was George Westinghouse, or maybe it was J.P. Morgan, I think it was Morgan, when he was showing this to J.P. Morgan and saying, look at this, look what I've done, J.P. Morgan said to Tesla, how am I going to charge money, how am I going to make money if, if you're doing free energy? And, and that, in a nutshell, that is a capsule statement of how we got to today with the energy companies. Imagine if the energy companies had a different business model, one where they were the ones to install this technology. And you didn't buy it, but you leased it. Imagine that. You know, it's so sad that the poor guy died penniless because... You know, Edison wanted to use the direct current, and now we're using the alternating current. All from the very beginning, Tesla was right on virtually everything. And obviously, I believe he was a visionary in the sense where he claimed to have gotten his ideas from dreams. Uh, He was thinking outside the box, and it's very possible that some of the information came from extraterrestrials. That's what some of the speculation is. Would you agree? Yeah, there, uh, there was speculation about that. Tesla was um, Tesla died penniless for a number of reasons. A, he was his own worst enemy. But 
because of the um, uh, fight, the contest between direct current and alternating current, because of that, Edison became Tesla's lifelong. I'm writing a book on Edison that's coming out next year. Um, uh, Edison became Tesla's lifelong enemy, and um, he he thwarted Tesla every chance he could get. Tesla's big moment was going to be that at the start of World War One, he presented the um, the Naval Board which was looking at developing new weapons into some very advanced technologies, a robot guided tor uh, a torpedo, robot soldiers. I mean, it was incredible, a self-directing torpedo. It was Edison who was on the naval board that vetoed all of Tesla's plans. And that was going to be how he was making his money. In uh, Then uh, it was Tesla who was working on wireless transmission of sound waves at the very same time Marconi was. But Marconi ostensibly beat Tesla to the United States Patent Office and got the patent. So literally Marconi sniped Tesla out of getting the patent for radio. It was only at the start of World War II, and, and it was in 1940, when the United States was using, obviously, radio that Marconi sued the United States military and said since he owned the patent on um, wireless transmission of sound on radio that the United States had to pay Marconi, who by the way was working for Mussolini, he was a fascist, the United States had to pay Marconi um, license fees to use that patent. Well, the United States inspired Tesla to challenge that patent in the United States Supreme Court, and the United States Supreme Court awarded the patent for radio to Tesla, thereby depriving Marconi of any residuals. But the United States never paid Tesla for those um, license fees, so they got to use radio for free. So that was another big story of how Tesla died penniless. So the poor guy really got screwed out of everything. He got screwed out of everything. Oh. The only thing he got during the war was Tesla was working on an anti-gravity device and he went to the United States again the war board again and wanted money to develop his anti-gravity device but the United States government turned him the military turned him down so Tesla went to the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union gave him a grant of $25,000 to develop anti-gravity. Well, this freaked out the United States. So when Tesla died in, I think it was 1943, uh, in his hotel room, New Yorker Hotel, that hotel room was raided by the With FBI and the Office of Alien Properties, and they seized all of Tesla's notes, with the exception of his anti-gravity material, and guess where his anti-gravity notes went? To the it DOD? Went, it went to Wright Field ah, and General Nathan so Twining. Yeah, yeah. I got a quick comment for you, and then we have yet another caller. Here's an interesting comment. This says, I would like to see Bill Burns do a show on the environment showing a projection of what is to come with our growing population, its effect on the environment with increased pollution and ways we could turn it around. That was a direct message for you. Oh, obviously, that's a topic we could cover here, but definitely we have to. Uh, I wanted to pass that on to you, Bill. Now we got to bring on Stephen Kelly. You guys may remember him. He was a, a guest a few weeks back. He is very knowledgeable on everything. Me and him used to host open lines on another station a few years back. Not to mention, he is also on my team uh, helping with social media stuff. Uh, Stephen, welcome to the show. I know you got amazing questions to ask Bill. Go ahead. Well, you know, gee, like we said, you you got to bring me on. But first of all, uh, hi, Bill. Hi, hi Dr. Hi. J. Hi, hey, Johnny. Uh, I was talking to Dr. J earlier uh, about your coming on. You, he told me that you were going to be, you were an expert on Corso, and yeah, all that. He, he wrote the book with Corso. Right. Oh, wow. Well, it's just, I to me, that's really cool because. Um, I spent a lot of time working in all the various little areas that he said were, were given to us, the, uh, the semiconductors, the lasers, and the night vision, and, and everything in between. Uh, you know, so it's, I just thought it was really amazing to, to find out that all of that uh, came out. And I'll tell you something. 
the first before that book came out, all the scuttlebutt with the forward being written by uh, the senator and what have you. The, Strom uh, Thurmond. Strom yeah. Thurmond, right. He, uh, at the time I was in the industry, the laser industry, and I remember there was a magazine called Laser Focus, I believe it was. It was either Laser Focus or Optical or Photonics magazine, probably Photonics, that's the bigger one. But either way, there was a story in there about how... Uh, you know, they're kind of making fun of it, you know, and they had they, they showed a picture of a group of scientists with a with a gray and the gray was wearing a, a jacket or something. But he had his arm in a sling and he was standing in front of a room lecturing all the scientists, uh, you know, and tell them about all this stuff. And, you know, but being in the optical industry, electro optics industry, it's just funny because I remember in the 70s or what have you, that this stuff just all of a sudden took off. You know, everything from the lasers, the night vision, the, the semiconductors, semiconductor lasers, all that stuff. And uh, it was it was pretty interesting to be involved in that stuff. But uh, Well, the, oh, the lasers, um, lasers were in part developed at the, there was an Army Research Lab at Columbia University. And one of the things, and, and remember that before Dwight Eisenhower uh, ran for president and won, obviously, in um, 1952. But before he ran, he was the president of Columbia University. In fact, were you to go to Lowe Library at Columbia, uh, you would. there's this big presidential portrait of Eisenhower in his cap and gown at his installation when he was president. That was a holding tank for Eisenhower that knew that he was going to run for president. Truman had wanted Ike to run for president as early as 1948 because he thought that MacArthur was going to run for president, and the last thing he really wanted was MacArthur to be president. Uh, so that was something else, too. In fact, um, so Eisenhower was was at Columbia and helped establish the Army, um, the a laboratory at Columbia for lasers, Corso said that was where he took this particular device that came out of the Roswell crash. It wasn't that the Army, it wasn't that Corso was responsible, and again, said this again and again, Corso was not responsible for the invention of these devices. Every piece of technology that he took, he took to an entity, an organization, an industry, a laboratory, Fort Belvoir, he took it to a place where that technology was already in development. These were to jumpstart that particular development. And so the Army was already working on lasers and masers all the way back in the 1950s. So this was not new. It was seeing that device that the, you're talking about the device that actually burns but a hole in the wall. He's, let me, yeah, let me was, just say something. All right. What he heard, all of the, you see, this is the thing. When I say lasers and semiconductors, um, I'm talking about ion lasers because obviously semiconductor lasers eventually are going to pretty much make ion lasers obsolete. But we had to get through the, we, we had to learn, uh, actually, we had to learn how to build helium neon ion lasers in order for us to really boost our optical capabilities and that's what really allowed us to make semiconductors so it was, it was all cart before the horse type thing but the first step was an ion laser then once we were able to make the semiconductor we can make semiconductor everything including semiconductor lasers which is where mm -hmm. we're at but but yeah we had a I, I just remember in the 70s when they started coming out with commercial uh production helium neon lasers you know, 670 nanometer lasers. Just, just. I mean, before that, all they had was infrared. See, mm -hmm. and and then, and when it came to optical production, all they had was ultraviolet. They used uh, sodium, whatever that is. You know, the wavelength. But uh, but anyway, yeah. So so the semiconductor, not the semiconductor, but the 670 nanometer ion laser, is what really did everything. Because suddenly now we can make interferometers, and we can make all these things, and suddenly we can make 20th wave flats and 20th wave transmitted wave front optics and all this fun stuff and now we can make ultra high resolution wafers and blah 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 on and on and on and on so so yeah we had to because before that before the 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 uh, laser you know the red little neon laser right. we were barely better than Newton 
or Galileo when it came to making that stuff. And, and and now, I mean, as as recently as or as far back as the late 1980s, um, the the Navy, well, the military, was using lasers. I think it was blue green lasers um, underwater to carry trans uh, 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 to carry a transmission signal to. Um, submarines. So instead of a submarine having to raise its antenna to pick up a radio wave, now you could actually transmit um, data to a sub while it's underwater without revealing itself. And that was as that was in the late, late nineteen eighties. Well, and now it's failed, probably though. common. Gonna, yeah. yeah, they got away they got away from that. It was kinda I, I remember, you know, when they were doing that, uh, TRW and Hughes were, were the big laser people back in those days, mm -hmm. and they, they, um, that yeah, it worked. You know, they did do that, but it doesn't really go that far, to be honest with you. But, right, it doesn't. That's yeah, they, true. They got that elf signal now. <laughs> uh, let right. me uh, throw in one more thing. Tom has something more to ask about the, I believe it's the anti gravity. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, you were talking earlier about Tesla, the anti gravity thing going to Russia. What do you know about the story with uh, Ralph Ring and the whole thing with Otis T. Carr? What's your we, take on we that whole story? We, it was very funny. We actually interviewed um, Ralph and Ring. Maybe some of these folks don't know who he is or any of that backstory. So supposedly, these people had worked with Tesla on developing a device that was um, that would that would work. It was not conventionally powered. It was a flying device. And uh, I believe we, I forget who we interviewed. I, I think it, I think it was Carr, not either Ring or Carr. We interviewed. No, it was Ralph, Ralph Ring. Ralph Ring was like was one Ralph of his Ring. technicians. Yeah, he was just a technician right. worked on the project, but but Carr was dead. And evidently, before Carr was supposed to demonstrate the thing, he winds up getting whisked away to a hospital the day before. There was a lot of uh, skullduggery going on. And, well, uh, Ring said that he was actually in. Ring said that he was actually in the device that it actually right. worked. That, right. that it was in one place, they didn't feel any sense of motion, they felt a kind of a nausea, a sickness, and then it wound up at another place, and they had no idea how they got there. Here's a fascinating corollary to that. He said this, this was something that was developed on a Tesla theory of, um, of um, wireless, basically wireless, um, uh, you could move something wirelessly without conventional propulsion. Before the series started, before the UFO Hunter series started, we were all getting together with Bill Scott and a few other people at this hotel in California, in, in, in Los Angeles. And one of the people who was there was a test pilot. I forget his name. And even if I remembered his name, I couldn't say it. But he tells this story, and he told this whole group this story, that he'd been a test pilot and he just wanted out of the program. It was a very dangerous program, but he was working with the CIA. And so he finally said to the CIA, I quit. I want to be my own person. I am out of here. And he left. And he became a crop dusting guy in Florida. And he said, one day these two guys in suits show up at the airfield. And he said he could recognize him as he was landing. He could always tell CIA guys. They approach him and they say, um, we hear that you're having some problem with your pilot's license. And he says, oh, really? Uh, my license is current. There's, they said, no, 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 no. There's going to be a problem with your pilot's license. Now, we can help you out with that. So you're not going to lose your license and lose your crop dusting business. But we want you to come back. And we want you to do one more job. He says, I'm, and they, he says, I'm not coming back. And they say, oh, it's a shame because you've got such a nice crop dusting business. You've got a nice plane here. Be ashamed to lose that business. You wouldn't be able to support your family. Why don't you do this one last job? Then we'll let you go home free. One last job. So he finally agrees. He goes to Area 51 and he's in this large hangar. And he says, all we need you to do, this is a kind of a flight simulator. We need you in this booth and just follow the instructions you will get and do the simulated flight. When it's over, you're done. 
seems simple enough. So he goes into this booth, and the next thing he knows, there's this feeling of nausea, of dizziness. And they say, okay, they knock on the door, you can come out. He's all the way on the other side of the hangar. And he said, I don't know, I felt no sense of motion. I don't know how I got there, but I walked out of that place. I never went back and I never asked them. And, they, and as I'm walking out, they said, by the way, you can never talk about this to anybody because that will end your career. And he said, I'm telling you, but I'm not telling you my name or anything else. And that's the story that I heard from this test pilot on the day before we started filming UFO Hunters. You know, let me go back to Corso. And when you were mentioning his memoir, I really loved the fact that you brought up that it was just a Corso in the sense that he didn't just talk about, you know, uh, what happened in the 50s on. He talked about a very obscure incident that happened in 1947 in Roswell, where he actually lifted up a tarp, if I'm not mistaken. It was at Fort Riley, Kansas. There we go. Why don't you go ahead and tell the story, because you you actually co-wrote the book. He tells the story about he was stationed after, after he was yanked out of Rome. He, I can... That's a whole other story. It's a whole other book we never did. He's yanked out of Rome uh, by actually by Ike. Uh, uh, the British wanted his head because he basically um, liberated a displaced person's camp of um, Holocaust survivors and arranged with Lucky Luciano ah, and really and Meyer Lansky. Mob really? boss Meyer Lansky. He was involved with mobsters. I didn't know that. He was involved with Lucky Luciano and Meyer Lansky to get a freighter. And he, he managed to liberate this camp, marched them down to the sea, guarded by Army CIC troops, by the way, and set them afloat to Palestine. And this was in 1947 to, to, uh, to populate what would be the new country, Israel. And the British... This is, the, this is Exodus. This is the story of Exodus. And the British were so furious, they wanted Corso's head. They wanted him fired. Eisenhower got him out of Rome. He was the, uh, army, he was the head of Army CIC in Rome. He was the adjutant there. And Eisenhower got him out of Rome, posted him to Fort Riley to go to intelligence school at Fort Riley. And when he was the officer on duty, one night, uh, a truckload of cargo came up from the southwest, came up from Roswell, and they stored this, and I, I forget, the, the, but they stored this uh, in, in an old storage facility on the base at Fort Riley. And Corso was the only commissioned officer on the base's bowling team. Corso was an avid bowler. And one of his... Um, members of the bowling team, when he was, officer, um, he was officer on duty that night, one of the members of his bowling team was, was guarding the storage facility. It was an old, old storage facility, Fort Riley, and he was guarding it, and Corso was making his rounds as the on-duty officer, checking the sentries, right, yelling at the sentries, are you asleep at your post? Get up. And he seizes this guy, and, he sa- and so he says, are you, are you up? And the guy says to Corso, listen, he says, you know what's in here? And Corso says, yeah, um, I got this memo, um, this notice that there was a shipment of cargo. It's top secret. Um, I don't want to even talk about it. I'm told not to talk about it. The guy says, I was inside. Corso says, why did you do that? You're told now. He says, I was inside. It's all this weird stuff. And there are bodies in here. And Corso said, what do you mean bodies? And Corso went inside and said, okay, I'll look, but keep this quiet. And there are these crates, and he opens up a crate, and there is a body kind of half floating in this fluid. And Corso explained that the body was, basically, it was like a creature. He said that it was, it looked human, had a large head, um, I forget how many fingers it had in his hand, but it was this uh, this midget sized this this midget sized humanoid, and 
he said it was clearly not human. He dropped the tarp down, closed everything up, walked out and said he tucked it away and just forced himself to forget about it until he hit Army R&D in 1961. And that's when he said he had to go back and revisit that night uh, at Fort Riley, Kansas. I have a listener question here. I don't know if it's a little late. Uh, This is Alex Conrad from Philadelphia. Hey, isn't that you're near there, right? Can we make sure we fully cover Corso and UFOs? I believe we have then done done this, and this this is a little late, and I just now saw this, but uh, I we have, and I wanted to also bring up the fact uh, that when you were talking about the different companies, wasn't IBM one of the major companies that? bought this take or took this technology and reverse engineered it right there was ibm there was at&t there Ooh, was Bill, uh, you got a little static coming on is something happen nope everything seems fine That's unless fine. we have to reconnect yeah let me uh, just do a quick reboot with you everybody hang tight with him while i reboot with bill let's make sure that we are set and we are going to hear so much more on what is happening uh, with Corso, I think this is really one of the most important things. And what I like about it is why would a lieutenant colonel, literally in his 80s, sacrifice? And, and this is the way when I interviewed Darlene Hooley today, former Congresswoman Darlene Hooley. And I was, you'll, you'll all hear this. You'll all hear this very soon, whether it makes it to this network or it doesn't because of audio quality and it goes straight to YouTube. When my good friend Johnny, uh, that's online right here in Indonesia, returns to London, he will fix it up so you listeners can actually hear Darlene Oli say this. She interrupted me when I said these these top people, these listeners, or these top researchers and uh, people who witnessed stuff, so journals, colonels, uh, lieutenants, you name it, people who have credibility, unimpeachable in every single way, and I said, when they have nothing to gain, and she interrupted me and said, have everything to lose. And I thought, that is so much of a better way to put it. Why would this no-nonsense lieutenant colonel put out this story if it wasn't true? Now, just looking at it from that standpoint, not necessarily being a, a believer, if you just look at that and realize what this guy has to lose, what the, his family would have to go through then you really have to consider the story he told. Now, Bill, I know we lost you for a second. We're back. I'm Let's back. see. Yeah. There we are. Back to normal. If you could just get a little closer to that mic. Now, what you were just asking, answering the question about IBM that came in static, can you finish that? Well, sure. Um, what Corso did <clears throat> was he brought that the pieces of technology to specific companies working on, on those technologies. So obviously IBM um, ever since the 19, I was actually ever since the 1920s, but ever since the 1940s was involved with computers. And one of the things that Corso ostensibly brought, he said he brought were pieces of integrated circuits of silicon circuits to IBM. And one of the things that happened was these huge room sized computers that IBM was using uh, all the way back in the 1950s, by the 1960s, were tabletop computers. I mean, I remember when I was at Courant Institute, um, I was basically involved with developing uh, programming languages for use in the humanities based on the IBM 36060. And this was compared to the computers that we knew about uh, back from the 1950s, that that um, this was a small computer. It wasn't tabletop like a PC, but it was a small computer. And so that was, um, that dramatic reduction in size was made possible by integrated circuitry. Uh, and, of course, that, now, so we've talked about, of course, the lasers, We've talked about this integrated circuits, which now we take for granted. I, you, you listeners who have heard me in the past obviously know this story, but 
for those of you who have just recently started listening to this network since Art's return, there was a documentary that I watched that I believe was produced in 1990, 91, maybe even as early as 89. It was called Above Top Secret. It was not related to the book written by Timothy Good, although Timothy Good was in it. So was John Lear and several other people. And in it, they were talking about a crash and retrieval that happened in Africa, South Africa, where, sure enough, go figure, the U United States military was the ones who went and retrieved the, tra- uh, retrieved the craft. Along with the craft, they actually got a living being. Now, the being lived for two years, apparently, and it refused to communicate for a year, and it finally began to communicate. But what it did is it had a little device, and the way they described this in the late 80s, early 90s, and this occurred, I believe, in 54 or 56, in that range, this crash in the, I believe, the, the, I don't remember the name of the desert, the Kalahari Desert in Africa. And what he said, or the, the, the narrator said, was this being would link to this device telepathically and would be able to see uh, face-to-face other beings on ships that were orbiting our planet, that were further away in our solar system, you know, closer to other planets, and even its own home planet. Now, why I bring this story up is to show you how much our technology progressed. If you could link your mind with your iPhone, what would you have? Exactly what the alien being had 25 years ago in that documentary which occurred 60 plus years ago when that crash occurred. Now, when you look at it in those terms, our technology is literally growing at the speed of light. So you have to take, uh, you really have to pay attention to what Corso did. And that's why, Bill, I wanted to throw in that story because had it not been for, for what Corso's contributions were and then the fact that we have Moore's Law where every 18 months we're able to double the amount of capacity we have in you know a single circuit i think is just super fantastic and so think about that what they were describing 25 years ago in this documentary that i was watching was outlandish but here well, we are we'll look, at, we'll look at what we have now yes uh, yes one of the pieces one of the pieces of technology that corso talks about was a headpiece that he said um the the various people who were rummaging through the Roswell debris, they couldn't figure this headpiece out. It, would, um, it, 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 it literally, he said that based on the autopsy of this alien creature uh, that was done at Walter Reed, that it wasn't like the alien autopsy video, this was done at Walter Reed, and what they discovered was that this creature had um, a brain which had more lobes than a human brain. And there are a lot of other facets about this creature, but that there was a headpiece that they recovered that seemed to fit around the lobes of the brain. And the speculation, they never proved this, but the speculation was that the being was able to navigate the craft with its mind in other words there was no it wasn't as though there was like a joystick or a yoke or anything or a wheel it was able to the way corso described it was it could play like an instrument to navigate the craft and the fascinating thing is like now an esp now, controlled well it wasn't really esp it was more electronic wave controlled but we have that now. We have pilots who, by the way they move their eyes, by the way they move their head, can actually control helicopters. I mean, that's exactly the technology we have, that it's not just they think of something, they use their eyes, and this technology is now so prevalent, that's now part of the modern gaming technology for consumers. 
I didn't know that part, really. So th- this would actually make sense. And I've actually heard a really interesting story. Now, we're really running close on time. We got a, a little over, I, I want to say, seven, eight minutes left. Uh, but I heard that there was a video game that, of course, not only are we using technology to create this uh, super uh, jump in, in what you're seeing, uh, virtual reality and games that look so real that at first glance you may think are actually uh, television shows. But there was a game, I believe it was called Dead Space, that apparently was modeled after what really happened. Do you know anything about this? No, I don't. I, I, I don't know the game at all. I'd love to figure that out. Johnny's got a question. I think, the Go ahead, Johnny. I think in a movie, Predator in the 90s, you know, where his gun was on his shoulder and as he moved, it moved with him, you know, and that was sort of 90s technology. Almost, uh, you know, it's, it seems like, as you say, Bill, it's already here. Right, it is. I mean, um, now you have these helmets uh, on, on an F-30. Uh, uh, I take the, supposedly the navigational controls and, and weapons control on the newest jet, the the F-35. The computer technology is built into the pilot's helmet. I mean, the idea of a heads-up display, a heads-up cockpit display, was actually invented by um, a person who was working for the Office of Naval Intelligence, George Hoover. George Hoover just a little bit of conspiracy trivia. George Hoover was um, on the bridge crew of um, a scout ship off Pearl Harbor in December 1941 and or November 1941, and they spotted the Japanese fleet, and they radioed back that a Japanese fleet was on its way towards Pearl Harbor, and they were told to maintain radio silence, get back to base. So he was uh, on a patrol vessel that alerted the Navy to the impending attack on Pearl Harbor. So after the war, and, and um, after uh, he was employed uh, after the war, he did research for the Office of Naval Intelligence on the Philadelphia experiment in the Philadelphia Navy Yard in 1943. USS, on the USS Eldridge. Eldridge yes. Right. Yes. He, 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 he had investigated that, and his notes on time travel made their way into the Varro edition of the Morris K. Jessup book on UFOs. So it's his notes. Very important guy. Anyway, one of the things he did was he was Walt Disney's consultant what? for the Men in Space series in the 1950s. He was the personal consultant to Walt Disney for the Men in Space series on, on uh, Disney World in, in the 1950s. He was the guy who invented the heads-up cockpit display. And that heads-up cockpit display is now equipment on modern American cars and foreign cars. We actually have heads-up cockpit displays in Cadillacs and Mercedes and things like that, which shows you the level to which this technology has come. But that technology is now inside the helmet of the F-35 pilot. And that helmet is part of a computer mechanism. So when you think of this thing like... um, pilots have become almost like ETs, this helmet connects the pilots of a whole fleet, of a whole squadron of F-35s and handles things like identifying targets, locking onto targets, determining which plane should attack which target and what weapon the plane should use. This is all current technology. To be deployed this fall. We've also been Marines. using that, Bill, on, on the Apache gunship helicopters, I believe, since the sort of late 90s. Exactly. This is helicopter technology in the Apache gunships. Yes. Let, let me say this too, Bill. We're, we're actually running out of time, so I'm going to give the last three minutes to you, and then I'll, I'll cut you off and let you know when it's time to go. But I want to just back to Disney real quick. I 
knew he was definitely interested in this. And obviously being one of the nation's uh, biggest or wealthiest guys, there was a famous documentary when they were making Tomorrowland that not very many people have seen. And you could find it on YouTube now. You can it was, find it on YouTube and probably Netflix. Yes. Yeah. And it was very scary how accurate it was. And, and I thought it was just really amazing that they went that far to make it. Anyway, I wanted to give you the next two minutes to basically talk about, essentially, wrap up what we can, because we're never going to finish. We can go on for weeks straight, and I know I would still have more to ask you, literally on this topic alone, to speak to you about UFOs. I think we could literally, if, if we didn't sleep and spoke for three years straight, we would still have more stuff to talk about. Because well, the, uh, the thing about Corsa that was so sad was that he knew that he was dying. Uh, I had interviewed Corso, met Corso face-to-face in Colorado Springs. Um, was it in Colorado Springs or in Denver? It was in Colorado someplace. And when Corso flew home, on the plane, he suffered a hemorrhage. He had a herniated diaphragm. And they rushed him to the hospital, and, um, but he knew that this was, he was in his final years of life. And um, Corso had, had suffered a lot of financial, I'm not going to go into great detail, but he suffered a lot of financial reverses in the final year of his life. And unfortunately, one of the things he did was he was hoping, so when you say, why did Corso do this? It was a very commercial um, thing he was doing. He was hoping to sell a book and sell a movie. That's really what he was after. And so this wasn't some great patriotic feat, I'm sorry to say. But he, and, was he trying to do this to essentially to, to let us know? I mean, I know we're running out of time, so I'll give you a minute to, to let that, uh, to let you answer well, that. Well, yeah, I mean, this was, just, uh, this was a story, this was a story that he wanted to tell. That's exactly true. He wanted to tell this, but he also wanted to tell it in book form, which he did. Yes. And he wanted to tell it as a motion picture. Unfortunately, the documentary... Uh, came about eight years after his death, but the the um, and in the last year of his life, one of the things he tried to do was he tried to sell the rights himself. But these were rights that he'd already sold to the motion picture company, so he so couldn't he, resell them again. Huh? He wound up in the last year of his life in 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 just very difficult litigation with this motion picture company. And uh, at the very end, he was going to be at uh, Roswell in 1998. And he, but he and passed away before that, huh? He passed away, but one of the problems was that he had signed an affidavit. Uh -huh. And the, the affidavit said that Corso was a member of the National Security Council. He was not a member of the National Security Council. In the book, Day After Roswell, he says he was on the National Security staff. Then when I was part of this lawsuit, so when I heard that he'd signed the affidavit, and it was a false affidavit, so the charge was Corso perjured himself. <laughs> he was a man on so many painkillers, on so many kinds of drugs, that I would say he was that off. Yes. He was off in that last yep. year and he died months later. Let me thank you so much. Everybody, make sure you go to futuretheater.com. Bill Burns is a fantastic guest, and of course he hosts a show with his wife Nancy signing off. Mm -hmm.